Hey golfers, and welcome back to the Second Swing Thoughts podcast. Today we have a very, very special guest. It is Larry Bobka. If you've been following the YouTube channel or following what's going on with Second Swing, really at all, you are familiar with Larry. But uh, before we get into things first, uh, we got to talk about Second Swing Tour Van Fittings. Golfers, playing better golf doesn't have to come from hours and hours of practice. Optimized equipment could be all you need to shoot lower scores. At Second Swing, our award-winning master fitters use state-of-the-art technology and world-class training and knowledge to dial in golfers every day. Whether you're a beginner, a seasoned pro, or anything in between, you will save strokes with a Second Swing Tour Van fitting. So schedule that fitting today at secondswing.com. Mr. Larry Bob. I do, I do those. Yeah, I know you do. I do that's, those. Uh, that's why, I mean, it's been great to have you as a fitter for the last, what was it, 2019? Is that uh, when you Yeah, jumped, it's, jumped we're, jumped yeah we're like swing? three and a half years going in. Yeah. yeah. So it's been really cool to have, because we'll talk, we'll get into it, but I mean, your background, obviously. You've, have you have you actually been at in pretty much every section of the golf industry? Would you say that you have? The only com I never worked for a grip company. Okay. Okay. So that's probably but, the only that's probably the only thing I haven't worked for. Yeah. So. Because you you were a PGA club pro once yep. upon a time. Right. So you've done the the whole green grass deal. Yep. And then obviously you've uh, the, the manufacturing side and the club fitting side. You've yep. been a teacher, coach. Yep. So I mean, there's really only grips. But yeah, obviously. But I grew up. I grew up with Bob Lampkin Jr. because okay. his his dad and his dad and my dad were were really good friends. So uh, sort of by osmosis, I yeah, you yeah. know I I knew grip. So essentially, you've you've been everywhere in the golf industry. Pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close. Well, so there's a lot to talk about, and we probably honestly could have a three hour episode if we okay. wanted to, but we'll we'll try to you know narrow it down today. Right. We uh, could call this maybe part one. Yeah, we could do a part one. Okay. We'll, we'll have more parts of Larry Bobke interviews uh, in the future. But um, as we did when Michael joined um, a couple episodes ago, I like a little rapid fire. Sure. Get to know you. Sure. Type of questions to start. So some of them are, are the same as, as we did with Michael. Some are a little bit different. Um, but number one, your dream foursome. If you're going to go play, go play at Chaska Town Course tomorrow. Three people you'd invite to play with you. Oh, I'd probably, well, one of them have to be my dad because I pretty much owe everything in getting started in golf to him. And mm -hmm. um, so it'd be my dad. I would have to throw Mark O'Mara in there, who's been a great friend for many mm -hmm. years. And, uh, you know, I'd probably throw his dad in there, too, because okay. his dad was a great guy. I mean, I think that would be really cool that he and I could play golf again with our dads. You think there'd be a little match going there? Bob oh, of course versus... there'd be a match yeah, going there, yeah. yeah. Who would you give the edge in that one? It'd be a tough one. Well, I don't know. You know, <laughs> MO is pretty good. Yeah, I suppose. You, you know, know beat it, You know, used to play a lot of golf with yeah. him. I think I beat him once or twice. Then the next day he'd go out and shoot right. 63 or 64 and beat me by like eight or nine. So, oh, at least at one point you did. So yeah. that's that's a pretty cool at one point. At yeah. one point yeah. I could yeah, play. You yeah, could claim it. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think I know the answer to this, um, but the favorite club or clubs that are in your bag currently wow you know that's it's a pretty good question well you know it's pretty hard not to yeah. say lb1 iron okay. right yeah okay um we just i just did some wedges some lb1 wedges which will be coming out soon okay. um pretty happy with those you know then you go to the top of the bag and there's a couple different things because you know todd dempsey's made me some really mm -hmm. nice new persimmon woods which i play you know, maybe 50% of my rounds with. And the other side, I've got some really great stuff from the, the guys on the Callaway Tour truck. Um, you know, arguably one of my most favorite clubs right now is I got a rogue triple diamond 10 and a half degree driver that goes nothing but straight. So <laughs> it, I'm pretty happy with that. It doesn't, it doesn't go far, but at my well, age, nothing goes far. Well, and I've... Now, I haven't actually had the chance to play golf with you, which we're going to have to amend here right. shortly. But um, from what I've heard from people that have played with you, and of course, what I hear from you is that you hit a pretty pretty straight ball every yeah. single time. Hit the you know hit the green or hit it straight enough. Get up and down if you need to. It's well, not, uh, and as you know, I've been having some back issues, so I kind of limped it around Chaska Town Course last last Wednesday for 74 and missed yeah. one missed one fairway. So. <laughs> 
And the funny part about that is I played Jessica Town Chorus yesterday, as of this recording, and I hit three fairways in total. Oh, wow. so, uh, very different styles of play, I think. Um, menu for Larry Bobka's Champions Dinner. Well, you know, I saw that question when you said that. And I, yeah. I, I will have to go back. Uh, when I turned 50 and I was still working for Titleist, um, belonged to Vista Valley Country Club, and my wife set up this wonderful 50th birthday party with, I don't know, 40, 50 people, mm -hmm. and we played golf when he came in, and, and this is the menu because this is this is what I like to eat. So we would start with shrimp cocktail, okay, Caesar salad with white and black anchovies, okay. okay. Then we would move on. We move on to a steak, yeah, you know, uh, baked potato, maybe a little cream corn, and then dessert is peach cobbler. Wow, how about that? See, I love this. You got the whole all the courses dialed yeah. in. Yeah. yeah, how about that? How yeah. about that? That would be. I I would enjoy that. Yeah, I would. Um, I and, haven't. And, and and if we're gonna have a couple adult beverages, oh, I think that would be permissible. Yeah, we yeah. might we might have to have a little vodka on the rocks. Yeah, Tito's yeah. on the rocks. By Tito's the way, Tito's on the rocks. Okay. Yeah, if anybody from Tito's is is watching, <laughs> big supporter of yours. There you go. I've actually seen it, and I've seen it. In, and I in do that, the, and I do lunch. that because that's my that's what my dad my yeah. dad was a big Got vodka a drinker. Down. So yeah, I like it. I like it. Well, I know for a fact I would enjoy that meal. Uh, that sounds like a pretty solid menu right there. Yeah, it's pretty good. But but you know, having traveled the having traveled the world when I worked for Titleist uh, in UST, I I love food. You know, yeah. you don't get a body like this without being a foodie. So, <laughs> you know, I, I I have eaten my fair share of food and probably even more than my fair share. So. Well, that's good. You've you've earned it though. You've earned it. So I, I think so. <laughs> um, kind of a little bit. Uh, changing gears here, but yep. uh, first of all, have you ever had? You've you've probably made an ace, haven't you? I have one? two. Uh, any albatross? No. no, no. What do you think is cooler? What would you rather have your next? Like, would you ever, rather have a third ace, or would you rather have a first albatross? Uh, I would probably I'd probably like the albatross because I've only ever seen one. Okay. And um, hole in one, I had one first round of the 1981 Illinois Open. I made a hole in one. Okay, so I made a hole in one in a tournament, uh, yeah, that's and a then deal. I don't know how many years later at my club at Vista Valley in in California, I made another one. Okay, but um, really good friend of mine, Alistair Harper, who I played a ton, a ton of golf with, on a par five, hit this cut three wood, and it's coming in, and hits the left side of the green, and it's rolling, 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 and we're watching this thing, and all of a sudden it disappears. And he turns to me, and I can't say what he said, but, <laughs> you know, he turns to me and he's, he goes, you think that? I go, well, it's either in or it's right behind the hole. I mean, yeah. we can't see it from here. And he made it. But it was so cool because it was because it went so long. In the, it was like slow motion. Yeah. If going it's almost in. like time slows down. As you're yeah. And the, the other, other cool, too, was my son Curtis and I were at the Masters when Oosthuizen made the two. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, when he made mm -hmm. the two on number two out there. That was another one where time almost slowed down. You could watch that ball. And, it goes and right up the middle of the green. And we were we were close to, to that. Right. We weren't there to see it, but the roar was just unbelievable. Yeah. You could tell something really special happened. Yeah, and normally you hear a roar like that. I imagine, I mean, obviously you have a tournament where Tiger might be playing or whatever. Right. And the second hole, it's like, you know, yeah. usually it's a back nine type of deal. So you obviously have to Yeah, and it's, and it's weird because at Augusta, you know, there's hole in one. There's a lot of hole in ones on 16, yeah. especially on the, on when they put that pin mm -hmm. down front left. And, uh, but yeah, this, this was different. This was, this was, you knew somebody did something yeah. exceptional. Wow. Um, all right. So. And then this one is, we're going to go back to the LB1 irons. Yep. Um, I know you've, if you follow Larry on Instagram, you always see the, the posts and him sharing of people that have put them in the bag. Uh, the coolest piece of feedback that you've received, or maybe the, you know, you, maybe they've been, they've been put in a bag far away somewhere or someone really cool has played them. So what, what's your feedback? There? Well, it was actually, I got it this weekend was um, uh, one of the Instagram followers sent me a picture and, and, one guy's left-handed, one guy's right-handed, and they had left-handed and right-handed LB1 irons, and they're playing at Royal Dornick, wow. and they're on this trip, and they just wanted to show me they're playing the clubs, and they're like, oh, by the way, 
there's another guy in the group playing them too. So, yeah, you know, I I enjoy that. I mean, that's yeah. really cool to hear. I mean, that was the whole idea of making them and making them, you know, where they're they weren't unaffordable. I, I mean, I want people to play golf with them. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know? it's it's been awesome because I well, I guess here's another kind of a question on it, and we can sort of transition into the the whole handmade sticks. Um, the brand and how that kind of right. came about, but did you ever envision building clubs as part of this, or did that just sort of happen kind of organically through it? Well, it kind of, I, th I think it really happened kind of organically because we were kind of going through um, originally with Simon, you know, our yeah. CEO, yeah, yeah. and Simon, and Simon's talking about, hey, we're going to do this, we're going to create this brand, and whatever, and you know, I don't know, maybe it was about four or five meetings into the startup of, you know, one, trying to pick the name, Handmade yeah. Sticks, and everything else, and he goes, what are you going to do? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you're going to make some clubs, right? You got to, you got to do something. Yeah. So you know, I started with the putter, mm -hmm. and then did some, did some forge wedges, and you know, I'm like, well, kind of playing around. I'm like, you know, let's see. I might, I, you know, I've got a few contacts, and well, let's try a set of irons. And I, I remember him walking by the desk right out mm -hmm. there, and he kind of looks, and he's like, what are those? Yeah. Like, well, well, those are irons that I've been working on. Oh, can we sell this set? Can, <laughs> can we get? Can we sell? How many sets do we have? When? When can we go? What? You know? Yeah, yeah. How yeah. much can we sell these things for? And so that was the. You know, that was yeah. So it kind of happened organically. But I have to tell you, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Getting back into doing it. Uh, you know, you as a club designer. If, if I take a look at the stuff that I did back in, you know, mid 80s in with Wilson to stuff that, you know, I was involved in it, uh, Titleist to now is you, you always learn from every set that you make. You know, you kind of look and you look at a set and you put it down. And it's like, man, I love every club. Oh, the eight iron just isn't any good. You know, so you kind of learn, you kind of, so you start taking all those things in there and kind of decide, all right. Okay, I'm not going to make that mistake. I'm not going right. to make that mistake. I'm going to make sure this is the way it is. And, um, you know, I, I just, I looked at this and went, well, hey, you know, I'm using a material that people loved in the 962B. Uh, I look at some of the blade irons now. Um, I've never been a fan of real thin top lines when it comes to, you know, an iron because I think it looks a little weak. Plus, if the weight's so down low, and you don't have enough mass, you know, when you hit it a little bit above the center of gravity, say if you're in medium rough or whatever, the ball doesn't come out very good. So I wanted to leave something that was a little, you know, it might look to some people a little bulky for a blade, but I just think that it, I just think that it works, and to me, it it makes a better golf club. Right, and well, it, it certainly doesn't look. I mean, it looks. It's beautiful iron. It's an elegant iron, um, and it's and it's for someone like me who has traditionally not. I've never played a blade. Right. Um, but even looking down at it, it's for a lot of people. For maybe as many might be, you know, might be bulky to them. There's right. probably more people that look at it and are actually. It's almost inviting to to see a rather you know yeah well, large uh, top line. I mean, a golf clubs everything. I mean. I, Real quick story, you know, I remember we were working on some irons and back in the Ping Zing days and I was at Wilson and, you know, robot testing and moving the weight around and everything and we had this prototype and I remember showing it to Hale Irwin one year and Hale looks at it and he goes, well, if I have to play this, I quit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Quit. I mean, I'm like 25 years old. He's like, oh, I'm going to quit. What do you mean quit? He goes, I can't play that. He goes, I can't be standing on the 72nd hole of the U.S. Open and have to hit a five iron on the green. He goes, I cannot look at that thing. And then you start to understand, you start to realize and understand, you know, after playing junior golf and, and some high, uh, college golf, high school golf, college golf, and then, you know, played a little bit, played some mini tours, you start to understand, you know, what, what makes up a better player after a while. And then the guys that are, you know, the guys that are winning U.S. Opens and golf tournaments and what they're, what they're thinking and what they're looking yeah. at. Uh, it's really different and it, you know, they run the gamut from not picky at all to incredibly mm -hmm. picky. 
Yeah, I imagine over the years you had kind of uh, the the wide the whole the, the whole spectrum of sort of picky Absolutely. Versus, versus not picky. Um, so on the handmade sticks thing, the I guess the the we talked about this with Michael when he was in here, and so I kind of wanted to get maybe on your perspective of it being um, you know kind of using the connections you've made over the years and sort of assembling this sort of staff of of craftsmen. What what are you really like? What's the goal or the mission, I guess, of, of building this brand? And what do you want people to, you know, when, when people see handmade sticks, what do you want them to think? Well, to make people aware that, you know, there's okay, there's the big companies, but there's also these these small craftsmen out there that are making some really cool stuff, and that there's really cool there's alternatives, you know, mm -hmm. and hey, you've seen it. We get golfers in that play. I mean, here in Minnesota, play crazy a number of rounds. But you go to the Scottsdale store and now the Dallas store, and you got guys that play thou, you know, play hundreds and hundreds of rounds a year. Mm -hmm. But they're also looking for an alternative. They're also trying. You know, it's kind of like, you know, with the Todd Dempsey and the Persimmon Woods, and we're actually adding another guy on uh, very soon with some some replica uh, Persimmon Woods. But they want to play something different. They want to see what the players back in the day played, and see how hard, see how hard the game was back mm -hmm. then. You know, so I think everybody's looking. You know, Tad Moore does the Hickory stuff. We've done the Hickory things with him, and it's just fun to every once in a while go out and play some golf. And, and you know, to me, golf's a, the experience. To me, golf is not, you know. Uh, it's out if if you and I were playing and we had you know we had Michael and Simon or whoever we had I mean it's about enjoying the time mm -hmm. together you know hitting some good shots challenging yourself having a little fun maybe you know betting a few dollars here and there right. to see you know it put a little pressure on that but that's what golf's about and when you get done you sit there and go you know I, I think Payne Stewart said a great one time and you know at the end of the day if you can't shake the hand of your opponent and smile and say, you know, you enjoy the experience, there's, I think there's something wrong with yeah. you. Yeah, that's why we, I mean, that's why I know, I know you said it before too, but the, uh, what pulled you into kind of working here was just that it's all of us here are just golf dudes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like I like to say, it's golfers helping golfers. Right, yeah, you that's know? really what it is. Yeah, I mean, I have people walk in the bay and guys start telling me stories about, you know, I had this club and that club and, you know, I'm doing this with my swing, blah, blah, blah. And, they, you know, they'll turn around and go, you think I'm kind of wacky, don't you? And I'm like, no, <laughs> golfer. <laughs> We've all been through that. It's we actually, I, I would say every golfer at some point, if they've been a, a you know, diehard player, they, they play that, that 50 rounds a year or whatever. They've been there before. Well, I can tell you when I, especially when I, especially when I work the Titleist, I mean, you know, I'd fall in the same trap that all of a sudden you, you play around the golf and it's like, and you know, having access to a lot of shafts, and other, it's like, I think I need to change my shafts. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just not feeling right. They're not feeling good. It's like, oh my gosh, you can drive yourself insane. Sometimes, sometimes it's bad to be in my position because then you're like, holy, you know, mm -hmm. maybe I just back in the day when I had one set of clubs, you just go right. figure out that set of golf clubs. Yeah, you know, yeah, you just you just make those you just make those clubs work. Yeah, and it's things have definitely changed since you, so you, since you, well, you, well, let's, let's go through the resume of of, of Larry Bobkin, okay. kind of the the time, maybe the timeline, but also just where you've all been, because it's been primarily in the you know the golf clubs era of your career. Right. It was sort of Wilson, Wilson, you helped start UST, UST shafts. Yep. yep. Then over to Titleist. Yep. You were also with R Golf, R Golf for, for a while, while with the putters. Yep. Um, now second swing. Yep. So, I guess going back to Wilson, is there, you know, while you were there, is there something you learned that kind of prepared you for what was after that in your career with golf, or was it just sort of a on the fly? I just you kind of just took oh, everything in. Type no, I, you know, I, I tell the story and I, I tell our fitters and I've told people that worked for me for years, like my first week or two at. Wilson, we're at, uh, we're going to the Western Open in Chicago because we're based out of Chicago. And Joe Phillips, who's the legendary VP of promotion for, for Wilson, we're getting out of his Cadillac. And 
you know, I'm sitting in the passenger seat walk, take a couple steps, and he turns to me and goes, hey, Larry, because you got an ego? Well, that's kind of a weird question, you know? Yeah, of course. Everybody's got an ego. He says, well, I don't care how big or little your ego is, but you go back open that door and you throw your ego on that passenger seat because we're going out there and it's all about those guys. Okay? You listen. It, it doesn't matter what I think. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, and I even, you know, even in fittings now, I don't try to impose my will. Will I direct somebody? Will I pull clubs that I know this person is going to hit better in shafts? Yeah, absolutely. But if somebody is, if somebody is, you know, hey, I really, I really want to get a set of Callaways with this, you know, we'll, we'll try the best to make them work because mm -hmm. that's what's going to make them happy. You know, so I, I kind of look at it kind of from, yeah. you know, from coming at the highest levels down to, to the retail level, as mm -hmm. I like to call it. But it's the same thing. You know, it doesn't matter if, if the guy's won five U.S. Opens or, you know, he's just trying to win his club championship or if he's just trying to take his handicap from 20 to 15. I mean, everybody wants to play better. Right. You know? Yeah. And they all have, you know, everybody in golf is probably striving for something. It might just be as, yeah, as general as I'm trying to play better, shoot better scores. It could be, you know, at the top level, I'm trying to win a major championship. But, uh, you know, it, it is ultimately about what that person thinks and their perspective on right. the clubs or the shaft or the whatever that they're trying totally. to do. Uh, and I know that's always, I think what you said one time was, you know, when you, I, this was actually when we went to the, uh, the Holes for Hope event. Yep. And I remember you were telling those guys, you know, that person is the most important par person in my life for Absolutely. the next half hour, hour, yep. whatever it is for that fitting. Yeah, you have, I mean, you, you have to be that way. I mean, I think to be, if, if there's one thing I learned through the days at Wilson, working with Joe Phillips and Bob Mandrella, um, who is arguably one of the best iron designers ever, um, it was just to be totally focused on, one, if you're working with a player, you gotta be totally focused on who that player is. I mean, it was a hell of a lot easier back in, oh, can I say hell? I mean, <laughs> yes, you can. It was a hell of a lot easier, <laughs> it was a hell of a lot easier to do it back in 1985 if a player came in because you didn't have a cell phone to worry about so nobody was ever yeah. looking at their cell phone but no just to focus on what they want you know um, another guy that spent a very short period of time with but um, so I was designing a new line of woods for for Wilson and all of a sudden Joe Phillips walks in with this short Italian guy and I'm like I'm like holy crap it's Tony Pena I mean, Tony Pena designed all the great McGregor driver, all the Tommy Armour mm -hmm. stuff. That was all Tony Pena's design. And, you know, and, and he always said, you know, look, listen, and copy. You know, look at what the player's doing. Listen to what they say. And a lot of times, listen to what they're not saying. You know, when, when a player hits a club, he might not necessarily say anything. What's the fit, you know? watch their face, watch what they're doing. And then for us, you know, copy back in the days was, you know, hey, if, if, you, if you got a wedge, somebody likes a wedge, they like a set of irons, you gotta be able to imprint that in your mind. And then when you go out on the wheel there to remake it, you need to, you need to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me here, it's just, you know, I, I just watch what a player does. You know, a lot of times, you know, just kind of chatting with some player in a warm up. And, you know, they're, a lot of times they're kind of expecting, well, hey, you're going to measure me for this, you're going to do this for that. And, you know, I just like watch what they do. You mm -hmm. know, I like watching their manners. I like watching their warm up. Right. Well, and I know that you and any, all the other fitters here, too, know that, I mean, you would love to have more than an hour or whatever it is. Oh, yeah. A lot of times you don't. And right. so you kind of have to take as many mental notes as you can in that first, when they're just warming up. Like, right. hey, I'm going to watch yeah. your swing i'm going to watch how you go about getting ready for that shot or that swing and you take as many of those notes as you can well it, you know and for me it's for me it's great because having taught golf before and still being very much involved you know especially with the university of minnesota mm -hmm. and the players and still still teaching some golf um so i look at it both ways you know it's kind of like well do they have some swing flaws that 
maybe I can't fix fitting a club or what am I gonna what am I gonna do? What's the thing I'm gonna help this person with the most? You know, and that's usually my number one question. Hey, what you know, when you're hitting your set, when they're hitting their gamers, what do you don't what's the thing you like the least? Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't go far enough. It goes too far right, it goes too far left, it's too low, it's too high. I mean if you if you get that then you the other stuff falls in line. I mean, it's just like teaching golf. You know, you might see somebody in, you know, I look at your golf swing and maybe there's I see three or four things I don't like that you do. But if I can get the number one, the biggest problem that I see in your golf swing fixed, a lot of times two or three other things fall in line mm -hmm. because of that. And I think you know? what's and what's cool too, I'm sure you've figured out obviously a bit, you know, being here three, almost four years now is that you, it's not just like a one, one fitting most of the time. And then it's, you never see that person. A lot of times it's, we'll do a fitting and you'll, that player improves. And then well they, you know, it's a hybrid that needs to be fit. Oh yeah. I, I, I mean, or the I, driver, yeah. Know? I had a weekend, I had a weekend of, you know, Hey, you did my irons. Let's do yeah. the driver in the fairway woods. You know, let's do the wedges now. Hey, you got to talk about the putter. So, yeah, I mean, I always look at it. I always look at it as a relationship. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it has to be. I mean, if you're if you're not looking that way as a fitter, I think yeah, maybe you shouldn't be fitting golf clubs. Right. Because it is. It. I, I know from your experience and what you've shared with me, but also even, um, you know, I have friends or you know even other fitters I've talked to. It's like they see the same player over and over. Yep. It might be once a year. Might be more than once a year or they're updating their bag or getting fit for what they need, you know, updated. Well, and the they most. get comfortable and then, you know, you get another guy from their force and, you know, or it's, if it's a husband, you get a wife, you get a father, you get a son, you get a, you know, so, but you have to create, you know, you kind of have to create that relationship and make sure that they want to come back because it's advantageous to the player mm -hmm. not to go to a different fitter every time mm -hmm. because, you know, fitters are fitter, you know, sometimes, I mean, I try to give them what they want and what they need and we're going to get a good set of clubs there. You know, sometimes fitters have different ideas and maybe we need to go this way or that way. And I'm not talking about our company, you know, some other mm -hmm. things out sure. there and, and might not be necessarily the best thing for somebody's game and right. uh, you know and at the end of the day i just want people to play better mm -hmm. i mean i want people to come back and i want people to refer me and you know because uh heck like you know melissa says that probably like pretty much nothing else you can do so you might as well you know might as well help people when it comes <laughs> to golf because you can't cook you can't clean <laughs> You don't do the laundry very well, and you know, Lord knows, keep me away from the bank account. So, well, I, the golf community appreciates the the knowledge, and maybe if if nothing else is is up your alley. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I so I, I I guess I'm curious because obviously now more recently you've been working with sort of the maybe the weekend warrior perhaps right. or the the, yep. the the average golfer per se. But obviously up until recently you've been working primarily with the best players in the world um and so and we talked about that spectrum of like you know the high maintenance player and the low maintenance right. player is there are there names that come to mind for a high maintenance or a low maintenance player that you've worked with before you really gonna make me answer this question i mean sure uh, um no i think there's there's players that tend to i think you you get players that tend to a lot of times um especially the advent of tour vans on tour, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can see a lot of players that maybe necessarily aren't playing the best and they're always in the tour van trying to figure something out, yeah. trying to get something out where there's other guys just grinding on the range and grinding on their golf swing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's a couple kinds of players out there on tour that, you know, hey, do I blame it on myself or do I blame it on my equipment? Yeah. Well, now it's a lot easier to blame and change. I mean, one of the great things about having the tour vans out there and for the players is depending on the golf course, hey, if there's high rough, they can throw a seven wood in, they can throw a hybrid. In. You know, they can they can make an, uh, a running change that week um, for a club that maybe they never had in the bag. I mean, remember at Beth Page, the first time of the year that Tiger won out there at Beth Page and, you know, 
Jay Haas, I remember walking a practice round with him. He's like, Larry, he goes, I, I, I got to get rid of my two iron. There's no way in the world my two iron's going to, he goes, I can't hit it high enough. I can't stop it. He goes, I, I need, you know, I need another club, figure something out. Well, at the time at Titleist, we didn't even have any, hy we didn't even have any hybrids yet. Mm -hmm. Well, at the time Titleist owned Cobra, went over to the Cobra truck in the old, the old DWS hybrids, threw one together for him. He care, I think he carried that thing for five years, maybe. Yeah. But it was a club that was needed, mm -hmm. you know, and especially now since the ball has changed. You know, the golf ball used to spin so much more. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't spin as much anymore. We have to right. launch it in the air. So now you never see a two iron anywhere. Well, yeah. no, and that's why you see, I mean, you look on tour, you see a bunch of guys playing seven woods. Mm -hmm. You know, you see a couple nine woods on tour. Uh, I think there's a guy in Europe carrying an 11 wood. Mm -hmm. But it has to be launched in the air. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the, I mean, the equipment has changed the game. Yeah. So. It, oh, it definitely has. And I think I remember. Did you like the way I avoided that question? About I do. The, the I hard do. Ones yeah, and, yeah. yeah. That's, that was, you know, you, you've done a few podcast <laughs> interviews in your day. So. Yeah. No, so, I, no and I, didn't, I didn't necessarily need a name. I just, I remember because I was on the, um, the Ping Tour truck years ago when they were here for the 3M Open. Right. And I was just, you know, I was poking some questions around with the technicians in there. And, and one of them mentioned Bubba's, Bubba Watson's grip uh, wrap, tape wrap. And how on, oh, it yeah. was like 13 wraps under the left hand and 15 under yeah. the right hand or something like that. And then it's just like, how does someone get to that, you know, magical formula where it's 13 wraps and 15 wraps of, of tape for, trial you know, and trial and error and I've, I've I, just been fascinated ever since with some of those weird quirky setups. I mean like when I were when I was at UST there there was a player that won colonial with a UST shaft in it next day called me up for 10 more shafts because he felt like the shaft was just a little bit soft and he wanted to try tipping them various various mm -hmm. and you know, this is back in the day before adjustable clubs. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, no, there, there's, there's tinkers. Mm -hmm. You know, I would probably, I would probably, not necessarily with my play set, but I would definitely call myself a tinker. I mean, I always, I always loved to hit everything. I mean, whether it was Wilson, whether it was um, UST, whether it was Titleist, anything that was being designed, anything was, I always wanted, because I always wanted to know because when I walked on the tee box, and I'm walking on the tee box, and it's Brad Faxon or Davis Love or David Duvall, and says, hey, you know, you gave me this new driver. What, is it, what does it do? Now, I never played as well or swung as well as he did, but I know that I took that driver out to play golf or took it over to the test site and hit some, hit some drives with it and knew what it did. So at least I had an idea that, hey, they might have a little pension to go left. Right. You know, kind of. We, we might want to stick a little rack glue in the toe for yeah. you. A little foreshadowing for the for the player when they. Yeah, decide, absolutely. You know. I mean, I think uh, if you're, you know, if you're working out with tour players, you better you better know what you're handing them. You know, mm -hmm. last thing you want to do is hand you a club and and they look at you and go, "What's this going to do?" And you go, "I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you don't know. I don't know." Yeah, which bad answer. Bad answer. Yeah, which I, it's kind of cool now, obviously, with the way things have advanced and. You know the the knowledge out there of right. center of gravity and um, the shaft information that you. I know our fitters are always like, yeah, this one. Here's a try this setup here. This will, right. you know, the weights in the heel might uh, might help a draw, right, or whatever it might be. But um, I can't imagine back in the day it was a little bit different without the launch monitors and the and that type of thing. Well, you but, pretty but much the, carried this, a, pretty much carried a roll of lead tape around with yeah, you. Yeah, because well, the principle remains the same. It's about where the weight is in the club. It's yeah, just, th just today it's instead of shifting a wrench here there you had to actually apply oh yeah you, tape. <laughs> you'd, you'd slap some lead tape on it or i mean i i still to this day i mean last summer a, a guy a, one of the guys that play golf with over a chaska you know somehow he's like man he goes my putter just it just got too much loft and it was you know it was an old ping and i said well i'll fix it he goes well okay i'll give it to you after round. i said no i'll fix it right now went over area some hard turf and he looks at it and goes, that's perfect. 
<laughs> I go, well, we used to do that. You know, you'd go next to the curb. You, I mean, you just, that, that, that's how you learn. I mean, I learned, I learned how to loft and lie. At Wilson was, you had a rawhide hammer, you had a rawhide hammer in a, in a, in a lead block and you're just, just beat it? you just beat the loft and lie into it. <laughs> Yeah, different, you know, kind of a kind I've of I've seen a the machines now. World. You do apply some, you have to apply some, some you have force to apply to, some pressure, yeah, to, but to make but it happen. Yeah, but. things, yeah, it it was it was a help. Well, it was a lot more fun back then. Yeah, yeah, it's d different now, but it, it's it's both ways are effective, right? Both ways, both <laughs> ways are effective. Everybody, you know, one of the things I tell players, and even you know, especially the Gophers and other good players, that hey, you know, golf clubs are golf clubs. Now you might look at your set of clubs and you know, the lofts are supposed to be three degrees between every iron or four degrees between every iron and blah, blah, blah. Well, hey, if your eight iron doesn't go quite far enough, well, why not just make it a little bit stronger? Yeah. Who cares if the gap is three degrees this way and then from Maybe your eight to your nine is way. five, the other it's three and a half, <coughs> excuse me. Um, doesn't matter. It's all about the flight and the distance. Mm -hmm. So you can't necessarily get caught up that that a set of clubs. To me, a perfect set of clubs is the one that flies the way it's supposed to. I don't really care what the numbers are. Yeah. I don't care if my five iron is a degree flatter than my other irons, but it flies because they're all individual. Shafts are all individuals. Even the heads, you know, you go, I mean, in this day and age, even with the, the heads, and they're still all individuals. Oh, yeah. And they can be slightly built, maybe. It's a very subtle difference in tolerance or whatever it might be. And well, and they're, yeah, and they're, you know, you're, you're finishing, the whole finishing process and ever. I mean, it, it's, it's better now than it's ever been, but you're still, right. you know, it, it's, it's, you know, you're trying, to, you're trying to create a friend. Right. Well, and especially if you're a... Uh, an avid player and you swing a lot maybe you find yourself hitting you've swung nine iron a lot more than seven iron and suddenly your nine iron might be bent a little differently Absol or, absolutely but know. yeah that's why i mean you know i had a guy in yesterday that is going to play some tournaments over in wisconsin and he just came in and uh we added a we added a hybrid to the bag but the, we would just went through every iron and made sure we had good gaps mm -hmm. you know i mean that's sometimes sometimes for for a fitting People don't realize you can come in, come in and do that. Yeah, you know, let's make sure your irons are good, and we've got a gap. We've got a gap between four iron and three wood, and let's, you know, let's find the club mm -hmm. that fills that gap. Right, right. And sometimes, actually, I've been there where I've done a follow-up fitting for my irons, and just having that confidence that, yeah, okay, my gaps are, are right. You know, I got that 12, 13, right. 14 yards in between. Yeah, that's all I needed. Now the confidence goes up, and from there, everything else can kind of fall into place. But um, so we have to, I know, we, I know you've done a lot of these interviews before and I think in either, every one of them, Tiger Woods has come up, but, yeah. um, so for those who don't know, obviously when you were at Titleist, um, you spent some time working with Tiger and this was kind of right at sort of his, that, that peak run in the, at the turn of the well, century. Right, right, right after, right after he got signed by mm -hmm. us. Yeah. And so I guess, you know, what was it, what was it like to work with him to build a set of irons for him to, you know, go out on the driving range and watch him hit golf balls. Well, it was it was great. I mean, you know, to to have somebody who's arguably, you know, you know, you talk about great players that, you know, Jack and Hogan and and uh, you know Byron Nelson, mm -hmm. Tiger, um, you know, yeah, to to be to be to experience that a uh, pan and and be a little part of that. That's pretty cool. Right. Yeah, I mean it's yeah, it's exciting. I mean he was great to work with. You know I got him. He was pretty young. You got to remember, and you know he played. You know he played ping i twos growing up. Then he switched to then he switched to Mizuno irons, and then you know then then we ended up making him a set of Titleist. Um, so it was good, and he wanted a lot of information back then. I mean I remember a story of. We were standing on the range at Houston, and it was was Butch, Tiger, and I, and Tiger's hitting shots, and we're just kind of hanging out mm -hmm. and start talking about different golf clubs, and 
I started explaining the, you know, the difference between a Forge golf club and a Cast golf club, how they're manufactured, some of the, you know, some of the pros and cons of either of them, and, you know, and he looks at me and he goes, hey, he goes, do me a favor tonight, call me and I won't pick up. And all that stuff you just told me, he goes, just put it on my phone because I want to have it, I want to have it as a voicemail because <laughs> I want to listen to it again. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, you know, yeah. that, you know, and watch a guy that, you know, warming up the week before he blitzed the field at Pebble Beach and, you know, he's, he's making little piles of wedges and little piles of eight irons and little piles of six irons, yeah. little piles of four irons onto the driver and you're like, wow, you know, you're ready. And he's, yeah. So, no, it, it was a great experience. Um, you know, I, I think... He kind of knew, he knew what he wanted necessarily, not so much in, he, he wanted what the golf club looked like. He didn't really know the particulars of, you know, how much bounce we're going to put on, how much offset we're going to put on. You know, having had a great relationship with the Harmons for years, um, you know, Dick Harmon, who passed away years ago, way too early, um, was one of my best friends. Um, so, you know, sitting there and on the range talking to Butch and knowing what Butch wanted for Tiger, what, you know, hey, when he makes this swing, I want, I need the ball to fly that way. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but then you got a guy with just massive talent. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. everybody forgets. I mean, you could, you can hand these guys and girls, you can hand them clubs that don't fit them and within three or four swings, they'll make them fly straight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, now under the gun, that doesn't necessarily help them, but if they're standing on the range just having fun and this club doesn't fit them, they're gonna figure out yeah. in a few swings how to make this work. Right. You know, so that's, that's the God-given talent that they have. So that's really cool to be around, but then you just gotta make them, you gotta make them something that they don't have to, when they're under the gun, when they've got to make that swing on the 72nd hole of the U.S. Open, that they don't have to worry about anything weird that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. They, that's where that, you know, that level of trust in, probably in you has to come in, where you're building, and it could be Tiger, it could be anybody, but you know, yeah. if, if you're, you know, if it's, could be someone you fit yesterday, or that's trying to, you know, contend in a club championship this year, or it could right. be in the past working with Tiger, working with, um, you know, Peyton Stewart or whoever it was, they were trying to win the U.S. Open. They have to, right. they, they shouldn't be thinking about, well, did, did, did Larry build this club right? You know, they have to know and have the confidence that he, you did. Well, and it's like I said earlier, it's, it's not necessarily thinking what I play or what I like, it's, but if it's for Drew, what's gonna help Drew the most? You know, and you might, you might look at a club and go, man, this is beautiful, this feels great. I'll look at it and go, oh my God, I can't believe he's playing this thing. You know, but that doesn't matter mm -hmm. because you're the one who's playing it and if, and if it's flying right and it performs and you have confidence in it, then you're gonna play really, mm -hmm. you're gonna play really good golf. I mean, remember years ago, Keith Fergus who, you know, came in, the airlines broke his, broke the shaft in his driver and he had this old McGregor M85 that, Oh my gosh, it was just, it was persimmon wood that was just, I mean, you wouldn't have paid $2 out of a barrel for it. It was beat up. And I mean, this, this club's won three times in the last 18 months, you know, and I'm reshafting it and I'm like, Keith, you want me to clean it up a little? Oh, no, no, don't, don't touch it. Just put the <laughs> shaft, just put the shaft, just put the shaft back in there and make sure I can hit it. I mean, yeah. 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 That's that, that's that. You know, confidence of the uh, uh, in the aesthetics, right? That it's a, it's a fragile thing for some players, but I know you guys as fitters have to work around that because some players are just like, well, whatever performs the best is what I want. But then there's also other players that are kind of fragile to it, and like like Keith in that story, where it's like it has to look this way for me. Well, it has to look this way, or you you can't mess up something that I have a lot of confidence in. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it, it's a little easier with with metals these days. I don't like calling them ones because they are metals. Right, right. Um, because they're 
there there's there's no ability to change them you know back in the day when somebody came in with a a persimmon driver or fairway wood they you know you you'd get the file out you could change the you could change the look of the golf club you know you could take the loft off you could open the face you could close the face you could do a lot more to the golf club i mean now we have the adjustability yeah. where we can open it and close it and that, that helps a little bit but it's just it's just not quite the same as it was back then where you you know this is like hey this is my favorite club but it's just can you just take a degree of loft off it and not screw right. it up? Yeah, yeah, I, I think, because that's where, yeah, I suppose as it's become more modern, the game, it's, there's some things that have been really nice to have, and then some things that I'm sure have, given your career, you're like, well, kind of, the old fashioned way was a little smoother. <laughs> well, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of fun back then trying to, you know, you, you, you figured ball flight out you know, if a guy's trying to drive her, you know, and they're standing on the range and might have three or four persimmon drivers next to them and they'll hit a, they'll hit all four of them on the range and then they'll the two that perform the best on the range, they take out on the golf course and play nine or 18 holes and hit them at different holes or hit the same driver in the same holes and they, they just figure out flight-wise, you know, into the wind, downwind side, which one was the best and that's the driver they were going to play. Mm -hmm. So you know, to me, it's still all about ball flight. You know, it, it's great having all the numbers. It's great having information. We can, we can dial somebody in a lot easier now, but still ultimately, I gotta go outdoors and I gotta create that ball flight. You know, that's one of the greatest things about, that I love about Second Swing, is we have a 30 day play guarantee. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, this club's beautiful indoors, but you know what? You got to go stand on the first tee at Chaska, or where you know where yeah. you play, and you got to be able to hit this driver down the middle of the fairway, or you got to be able to hit this hybrid or this iron. So you really, you know, it. We can do our job, but it still has to perform outdoors, and I think mm -hmm. that's you know to me, that's I love using the play guarantee, mm -hmm. especially when somebody's in between. A lot of times you get somebody in between what they want and what I want, what I think they should have. And it's kind of like, hey, do me a favor. Take the one I think's better for you. We always know you can come back and get this one. Mm -hmm. You know, if you play a few rounds of golf and you hate what I fit you in, you, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. Trust me, <laughs> there's, there's, there's way too many, way, I've learned way more from my mistakes than my successes. And, you know, take it out and try it. You know, and they'll come back and, Hey, that driver's really good. Well, yeah, I, I, I knew it. Yeah. You know, that's what I, this is what I do. Um, but, you know, but even if they decide that they didn't like it and they want, Well, then they great. walk out happy anyway. They yeah. walk happy they get, anyway. They now they, they, now they, they get an opportunity to try something, try this, and, and yeah, works yeah. out great. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I know that's, that's happened to me before, too. So it's, it's one of those where that, that 30 day play guarantee is, it's maybe not called out as much as it should be because you really you get to go out this club is fit for it you can try it right and then you have 30 days that which for a lot of people that might be 10 rounds you know yeah. and you have a lot of time to try it and if, if you're like all right this is not quite it right simple you just go back well, to the and store it, and especially it for players you know i i think the play guarantee is great for players that i mean let's call them less accomplished players mm -hmm. or new players i mean Especially through COVID, a lot of people got into the game. A lot of people got back into the game because it was something they could do. And, you know, they bring in a set of golf clubs that are 30 years old. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's the difference between driving a 30-year-old car and a car now. I mean, okay, it's still got doors and a steering wheel and four wheels on it, but a lot of things have changed since that point. Well, it's the same thing with golf equipment, and it's like, hey, you need to go play these. Mm -hmm. Go try these first. Go try these irons. You yeah. know, they are going to be different. They're going to feel different. You know, use the play guarantee to go out there and see how you like them. You know, uh, one of the things I like to do, especially in full bag fitting sometimes, is, hey, we're not going to fill, we're not going to fill the whole bag up. Maybe we're just going to buy 12 clubs today. 
We're going to save room for two more after you play these for a few rounds. Maybe I need a seven wood. Maybe I need a 60 degree wedge. You know, maybe I need to add a four iron to the set. Mm -hmm. But go out and try them and then come back and see. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, that's 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 the whole process of fitting. Though. It doesn't have to be a one-time thing. And it's like you said, it's a relationship that you build. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, one thing I wanted to bring up, too, before we kind of start wrapping up is that flag back there um, yeah. that you've graciously you know, let us use for the, the environment, the studio here, but, um, well, so let you, I'll let you have one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I know that, I know you've probably got a whole <laughs> arsenal I got a of few, them, but, um, so we talked about tiger. I mean, another one too, a, a big one in the golf well, in the history of golf, Phil Mickelson, multiple major champion. Yep. Um, we're going to be a hall of famer. So like work, how is it maybe compare, I guess the, you know, tiger versus Phil and, 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 and working with those guys. Well, I remember, I remember Phil, we signed, we signed Phil at Wilson and I, I don't, can't even remember the year, but, um, so we had just signed him. We had had the sales meeting at La Costa in California and he came in, they, we introduced him. We had a staff bag with Phil Mickelson's name on and he walks off, he walks off the stage and looks at me and he goes, I got the bag. Now it's your job to fill them up. <laughs> okay. Here we go. You know, and he's left-handed. There's not, you know, there's not as much available. Sure. Yeah. You know, and, and he had played, you know, he played Yonix. He had played Ping. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, again, it's, it's, it's a relationship. I mean, we played, Phil and I ended up playing a fair amount of golf together in Southern California just kind of figuring out, you know, and Phil kind of, you know, he's kind of the swashbuckler, you know, he's not necessarily the precision guy from, from shot to shot to shot. I mean, he's going to, he's going to try to drive, he's going to try to drive over the trees. Yeah. Oh, he's going to yeah. try to drive over the water. He's going to do what, what, you know, he thinks he can do and, you know, incredibly talented, incredible around the greens for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so it was it was a lot of fun trying to get him um, into a set of clubs. And one of the hardest things is now I'm a natural left-hander, but I play golf right-handed. Okay. So I've always looked at right-handed golf clubs. Well, as you as a club designer, even though you might even like the LB ones, okay, you got a right-handed set, and then you make the left-handed set, and all of a sudden it's just like they don't. You know, there's differences. Yeah. You're not used to looking at, mm -hmm. you're not used to looking at. So what I do is, you know, especially with the LB1s, you know, um, Brian Hills over at the store and Travis Barkley are very good players, you know. Mm -hmm. We got some some of the first uh, models in and prototypes in. It's like, hey, <laughs> what do you guys think? Yeah, does this look right? Because you're left-hand, because you guys play left-handed. Yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to do, so... That, you know, that in itself with Phil was kind of a challenging thing to do to figure out, hey, this is, this is, you know, left hand, is this what you're looking for? And, and when we did the, the PM, the 735 PM irons, kind of that, that from cavity to blade set, um, you know, he was, he was kind of more like, this is a shape, this is perfect, you know, any thoughts about bounce or you know, I don't know. You just put on what you yeah. think I need. So I guess in that way, Tiger and Phil were kind of similar in the sense that yeah. they both kind of liked the the shape yeah. that they wanted. They looked at it and that, that's right. the shape. Right. Now just make that shape work for me. Tiger. Right. And then you know you'd have guys in you know guys at Wilson and sometimes at Titleist. You know they they'd be turning over and they look at the bounce and the sole and I need it to look like this and I need it to look like well and that's okay. Those you know some of those players were considered to be the the high maintenance guys. Yeah. Not really, because mm -hmm. they they knew what they wanted to look at. You know, Hale Irwin was a perfect example of that. He just knew what he wanted. Mm -hmm. Just make it for me. Yeah. You know? So in some ways it's almost it's no almost e yeah, it's yeah. almost easier than somebody that's like, well I, I don't really know and you make a set and it's like, well these don't feel right. Well, okay. What doesn't feel right? And then they don't have an answer, that's great, and then you have to kind of figure it out and then yeah, yeah. I mean, you mean I made fair amount of sets for a few players that high bounce on irons, the low bounce on irons, and in everything in between. And you're like, well, hey, 
there's a reason that the stock set was built with a certain bounce because yeah. it works for a lot of the players. Now, mm -hmm. if you need a change from that, let me know. But yeah, so it, yeah, it's an interesting process sometimes with the players. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no doubt about that. Oh, I'm sure. And that's the, that's kind of the cool thing though, is that every player, whether you work work with them today at second swing or whether there was you know Phil Nicholson with Wilson back in the day, or, you know they're all they're all different and everybody's going to have a, your, their own desires for what yeah. the club, if they want it to look this way, or maybe they don't care about the look. So that's where you've kind of had to adapt all these years to make that work. Yeah. And you take a guy, I mean, you know, I still hang out a little bit when I go to Scottsdale, it's Tom Pertz or, you know, I've known Pertz for, I don't know, 35 years. And, you know, he, he, he's the kind of guy where, okay, Pertz, this is, this is what I think. I don't like the way that looks. Perch just hit it. He'll hit it really good, and he's like, "Okay, I'll play." You know, it's it it, 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 it. But somebody who hits it like he's had, like he does for so many years, there's no reason to get crazy. You know, that's where sometimes just go play golf. Mm -hmm. You know, I have some customers. I don't want to want to mention the name and he's actually turned into be a pretty good friend when i first start at second swing i'm like oh my gosh this guy's gonna make me insane <laughs> but you get to the point where it's just like the numbers are perfect go play golf mm -hmm. well why are your score well i mean he sent me he actually sent me a text this morning he's like man i gotta get better inside 50 yards well yeah <laughs> You know, you, you can't, who cares if you can drive it 300 yards in the fairway and you can hit a 170 yard seven iron and it lands on the green and if you three pot it, then what what the heck's it's the point, right? Well. Yeah. I mean, I can I can scrub a driver out there, slash a five wood up there, chip it up and make a four and you just made five after two beautiful shots. I mean, the game the game's about the number that you shoot, not necessarily about, you know, Phil Rogers who I spent tons and tons of time with you you've heard me say this before i mean mm -hmm. it's a scorecard it's not a postcard there's no pictures on the scorecard no pictures no style no yeah. style points your only job is to put the lowest number in that box mm -hmm. who cares how that gets done right you know and that's that's kind of as a fitter you have to kind of think the same way i mean that's where you get some players in that it's like hey i know you i know you want to carry four through pitching wedge, but you're really better carrying off a four hybrid, a five hybrid, a six hybrid, and seven on through, because you're gonna get you're gonna get better performance out of that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of you know, you know I'm kind of into the the less than fourteen sets. Yeah. I mean I love that because it's 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 about hitting golf shots. Yeah. It's not about standing there going, hey, I got a six iron in my hand. Or I got a distance, you know, do I pull my six? Or, well, if I don't, if I only have one, now I just got to figure out what shot it is. Right. You just need, you just need a club yeah. that works for every yardage. Yeah. I mean, and, I've seen, I've seen yeah. plenty of tour players, you know, practice rounds, U.S. Open, guy standing out there with a seven iron in his hand. And the flag might be in the middle for the practice round and he hits his stock seven iron, lands it, you know, five feet from the flag drops another ball, and if the flag was in the front, he just takes a little bit off the seven iron, comes up short, and if the pag is in the back, take, drops another ball and just kind of draws one to the back there with the same club. Yeah. You know, that's what good players do. Yeah. So that's where sometimes I think it's great for people to take, you know, get rid of half your clubs or take four or five clubs out and go play some golf and figure out how to, Figure out how to get around the golf course, mm -hmm. rather than worrying about pulling a club for it. Let's let's work on your game. Might be a fun game that maybe we'll play when we when we play sometimes. It's like, hey, pick your favorite eight clubs and we'll well play a match. You know, a really <laughs> cool part is I've got some of some of the gophers are into it. Well, they're not going to realize that part of the reason that they're I've kind of got them into it is they're going to learn a lot about their golf games and their golf swings over the summer. When they play some rounds like yeah. that, when they don't have a club there, how to, you know, now, now I learn a lot about myself and I learn about my ability yeah. to, to either hit one harder or hit one softer. Yeah, maybe you've got a shot in the bag you didn't know you had or, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it's. Maybe you know, the, the 120 yard eight iron little half punch is 
a go-to shot for you now. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I grew up as everybody with a starter set. I mean, you had a driver and a three wood, three, five, seven, nine, Sam Ledge and a putter. Go play. I never, Go make it happen. Yeah, and you know, when I was a kid growing up, I never knew any different. I'm like, oh. To me, that was a full <laughs> set of clubs. I didn't. It didn't. It didn't bother me. Well, to and play. it worked out for you. So. Yeah, it didn't uh, bother me. So it. I just think it. I. I think the game, you know, is as technical as the game has got. It's still a game. Yeah. You know, you still want to. You still want to challenge yourself. You still want to have fun. You still want to go out there, and sometimes it really doesn't matter what you shoot. It's all about, you know what, you know, I hit four or five of the best golf shots I've ever hit. And you know what, the next time I go play, I'm going to hit two or three more. And then I'm going to hit two or three more. And all of a sudden you find out, you start becoming a better player. I mean, it's like my buddy that was texting me about 50 yards, you know, dropped his handicap a couple shots. And he goes, just because, you know, just because I'm, I've got confidence in a bag of golf clubs mm -hmm. now. Yeah, yeah, that's ultimately what it's about. But um, that's a that's a good conversation. I think that's uh, we spent we've taken enough of your time. I think that's about. Well, okay, hey, it's my day off, as you can tell. I'm you know well, very, I, very casual, very casual well, today. You got you got the handmade sticks hat on. Yep, that, that yep. was that's mission accomplished for the okay. for the. So attendance any today, any so. Uh, anyone last questions you want to? I don't think so. I think well, here's what we'll do. Here's what we'll do. We'll have anybody that's either listening or watching on YouTube leave a question or a comment. Right. And then for part two, Perfect. we'll have a segment where you can answer some of the questions from the viewers and the listeners, and we'll go that way. But um, I think for today, for part one, I think we've, we've covered enough here. So there's obviously way more we could get into, but that's what part two and three and, and beyond are for. So. There is. And, you know, and, and, and I guess the one thing I will say about doing things like this, and as you know, I mean, I, I have been incredibly fortunate in my career to have a lot of people teach me and help me get to the point where I am now. So I just kind of look at things like this between, you know, helping out the, the gopher mm -hmm. golf teams and working at second swing and helping people. I, I, I'm all about sharing the knowledge, yeah. you know, cause I, you know, one, one of these days I'm not going to be around that hopefully not anytime soon, but, um, you know, I, I want people to know and I want people to understand and, and you know, and just share the knowledge of, of, it's a great game. I mean, I've been very fortunate in this game. I've gone around the world because of a little white golf ball and, you know, sticks with sticks with heads on yeah. it. So it, it's, it's a lot of fun and I, I enjoy doing this, so. Well, thank you for all that and for the time, about an hour now, so. Um, but uh, I know it's actually your day off too, so you took time out of your day off to do this. So, uh, viewers and listeners, please thank him for that. And uh, I'm sure yeah. the part two will also be probably on your day off. So well, that's okay. We'll to, that's all right. We'll, we'll make it work. But Larry, thank you for joining. Um, this was really great stuff. And uh, uh, I'll see you on the course. We'll do a little, we'll have a match at Chaska Town course. Perfect. Sounds good.